Welcome to the Heroic Minds Podcast, where we uncover the heroic stories of individuals battling through adversity and rising to the top of professional sport, business, and life. Uncovering the characteristics, the secrets, the tactics to become the hero of your own story, because it is adversity that maximizes human potential. Welcome back to the Heroic Minds Podcast. On today's episode, we actually have my old head coach from my last year of playing major junior hockey. He's now the head coach on another team, the Saginaw Spirit in the Ontario Hockey League. What's interesting about this conversation, and we're going to be talking about suicide, and then we get into different, a bunch of different topics, mental health, as we get going towards the end of the episode, then we start to joke around a little bit and hear some other stories off the topic of mental health, of course. But the reason I wanted to bring this up is having Landsberg on a couple weeks ago talking mental health, he had said that if you really want to help someone, you have to be as honest as you can and talk about things openly. And and then I looked back at other guests that I've had, such as Wally Shaw, who's a Muslim Canadian, talking about race and identity, and talking with Brock McGillis, the first openly gay professional hockey player. And so often we just avoid conversations because we don't understand or we have this assumed prejudice or negative connotation towards a certain group or idea. And so we never talk about it, and then we never become a better person for it. And really, I've, I've I've learned firsthand, having both those conversations, then talking with Landsberg about depression, anxiety, having those open conversations of something you don't understand does nothing but benefit you. And you can still disagree with it or, or whatever your approach is to the idea, but as, if you have the chance to understand it, it makes you that much more equipped just for life. You, now you have more knowledge. You can understand people better. And that's all life is, is working with people, working together, understanding each other. Again, not to agree with them or not. But this is a whole, this is a little bit of a step away. So talking about suicide, again, something we don't want to talk about. Something we think isn't good to talk about. We make that assumption. But really, it's actually educational. And and if anything, the benefit will be someone listening today, maybe. Or if this person listening today shares that with someone else, what they learned on this podcast today may now help someone dealing with the potential of depression, anxiety, and hopefully not, but maybe even suicide, and maybe they can help that individual. So it's, to me, it's, it's nothing but a win-win when we talk about things that we aren't comfortable with, talking about things we don't feel like talking about. So that's why I reached out to Troy, and to be honest, before I sat down with those episodes I just talked about, I told Troy, you know, I don't think I'm ready to talk about the idea of suicide. I, I don't think I'm where I am with the podcast or even in my own life to have the right to do that. And he had said, you know what, that's the issue. That's the issue with the topic of suicide, is that people think they can't talk about it, they don't have the right to talk about it. That's a problem. We need people talking about it. We need everyone talking about it, regardless of your education or where you are. And that's when it's going to help people. So, Troy's on today. My old coach, having a conversation about suicide that I never thought I would have. And I attached a picture of Troy and I, actually, from years ago. We were in London. And you can see the fans in the background behind us in their skin-tight green suits. I'm sure they were chirping Troy and probably trying to chirp me as well. But just a funny, funny picture I, sh- I thought I would attach to the social media for this episode. So, yes, unfortunately, Troy's younger brother committed suicide years ago. And that is what we're going to talk about today. But then we get into some other interesting topics, such as how to approach someone that doesn't want help with mental health. How to have the conversation with someone that may be having these types of thoughts. How all the trends of of enhancing your mental health, whether it be mindfulness or yoga, etc., all the mainstream topics, those aren't the only ways. There's so many other ways to reinforce or support or enhance, maintain, whatever it is, your mental health. And Troy tells us what his way is and one that I actually haven't heard of before. I think it's pretty cool. We even talk about his his hobby of playing Fortnite and his ulterior motive of why he does so for a benefit of actually building a relationship with someone in his family. All right, that's enough from me so far. We'll get into this episode, but before we do so, I actually sat down and chatted with the True Local gang, right, that people should know of, truelocal.ca, high-quality meat delivered to your doorstep, individually packaged. 
So I chatted with them and I said, I think we need more discount on the smaller boxes as well, not just the regular size box. So people can try the smaller box and then move to the bigger box after they realize how unbelievable the product is. So they actually gave me a discount code that is only for the podcast. So this is a secret. You can't tell anyone else. Capital letters, Heroic Minds 25 will get you 10% off a small size box or the individual size box. And then it'll also get you $25 off a regular size box, which is the bigger box. So again, that's high quality meat, individually packaged, locally sourced, and shipped to your doorstep in a box that remains frozen for four days with dry ice until you're able to pick it up and put it into your freezer. All right, here we go. Okay. All right. All right. Let's get to work. Let's, yeah, yeah, the serious stuff. Okay. Right. So yeah, so where, because I don't, I, we've never, we you and I have never even talked about this. Like I, I've never talked about this with you other than briefly saying, yeah, my, you know, brother committed suicide. I've never, we've never opened up about it. So before even getting into that, to lay the landscape of everything, where was your whole family at that point? Like where was everyone in life kind of thing? Uh, so it was, um, it was 2007. I remember that vividly, June 2007. And uh, I was actually at the NHL draft in Columbus when I got the call that my brother was in trouble and that I needed to get home. So thankfully the Rangers flew me home right away, but my family was all over the place. My parents are, are divorced. So my dad was in Brantford. My mom was living in Caledonia. And then I had two brothers, one living in Anaganish, Nova Scotia, going to St. FX. And the other one was living in London, England. So when it all went down, it was um, obviously traumatic for different reasons, but at the same time, we had to bring everybody together, which is a little bit of a challenge. So you, and you were how old? Um, I will, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> I have to think about that. I was 29. So and you and both your brothers at that point were. So the three brothers, I have an older brother who's two and a half years older, a uh, younger brother who's also two and a half years younger. And then, uh, my youngest brother, Mark, who was the one who completed suicide. He, uh, he was, uh, five years younger than me. Five years younger. And at that point he was in. Where was he in life? Uh, he was in he was in Hamilton, really just trying to sort out life. To be, to be honest, he was living in an apartment with his girlfriend, and and uh, you know it had uh, you know some some issues getting jobs and things like that. But you know seemed to be kind of on the right track of life, where you know he was seeming, seemingly going to turn it around. And so, when you say turn it around, were there a lot of outside factors affecting? where he would have been mentally in life at that point? Uh, it, it's tough to say, you know, that's that's the the hard part about it is, you know, I, I didn't realize where he was. And, and that's really where, you know, when I do talk to, to kids and the schools and things like that, that's that's my big thing is like, there there's a team out there because I wish he had reached out to me and, and spoke to me about it. But, you know, Mark was a, uh, he was a fun loving kid. We used to call him MacGyver, which, you know, for your vintage, Ben, you may not remember MacGyver, but he was this, it was this TV show character. He could basically do anything. You give him a garbage bag and he'd make an airplane out of it. And, uh, you know, Mark was always like that as a young kid where, you know, he was very creative, very artistic. Um, and, you know, throughout his life, you know, school wasn't his thing. He was never, never going to be a, a, a high end student, but um, was one of those guys that everybody just loved because of his infectious laugh and just the way he was. And, you know, he was, uh, you know, still a young kid. So he was 24 and trying to figure out which way his, his life was going to go from a career and relationships and things like that. And, right. and uh, you know, unfortunately, we never got to see that. At that point, when, when you heard the news, because I'm sure that you've talked it through maybe mentally now a lot differently than when things instantly happened, would you be, do you even remember when that that like the emotions at that point, because I'm sure you've you've f tried to figure out ways to rationalize it. At that moment when you first heard, what was the initial, like was it a huge shock? Or was there any type of, just not that it was anyone's fault or there was a direct reason. Could you have pieced things together at that point of how uh, things may have ha happened uh, or why? I, I guess yes and no. I think the, the, the first uh, inclination was was shock and and really you know everybody deals with things differently for me I just shut down my emotions is really what I did I knew you know for me uh, you know I've always kind of considered myself as a strong-willed person that um, can lock down the emotions when I need to and that's 
that's really what I did. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. That's that's just how I reacted. Where, you know, I wanted to be uh, stoic and calm for for my parents and and for my brothers that uh, you know were going through it together. But I, I really felt I needed to be that person. Which, you know, what looking back. Not sure that's the the healthiest thing, you know. But people react in different ways. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I guess you know if I was to take something from that, and you know, it, it's not about piecing together whether or not that person showed signs or not. It's it's about you know awareness and, and talking about things and and making sure that people know that it's it's okay to to talk about emotions and and we talk and and Mike Babcock has done a great job of, of this but people talk a lot about being you know mentally tough and strong and everything else and and there's two completely different definitions of that you know for for me in my day-to-day -day life with the hockey team yeah you, you got to be mentally strong where you know in the middle of a game you can't let the emotions get the better of you you have to make sure that you're executing a game plan you know playing hard all all those you know kind of hockey cliches but you know that doesn't carry over to real life where you know what being mentally mentally tough and being strong you know, there, there's a flip side to that, and I, I've changed my mindset since uh, since that happened 11 years ago with Mark. Is that, you know, what being mentally strong is also having the ability to to be vulnerable and to to show people that it's okay to to talk about things, um, you know, that may be affecting them, you know, mentally, things that you can't see, you know, and and really. You know, I, I couldn't tell you that there was one thing that I saw with Mark. You know, the only thing that I really wish and, and the reason why I speak uh, openly about it now is because I want people to, to be able to talk about it. And I wish I could tell Mark that, you know, hey, you know, we, we, we would have helped you. You know, we love you and, and we wanted to see, it th see you through it because, you know, my life and, and you're no different, Ben, you've been through it. Like it's, especially as a coach, it, it's wins and losses. And, and Mark, no doubt in my mind, is, is my greatest loss in life. You know, as is, is losing any family member, but you know, my my greatest victories have all been through a team, and, and really, you know, I think there's been some great work through people like you and and some others that talk about mental health, and and now kind of getting the word out there that there is a team for everybody, no matter who you are, no matter how low you may think it it may be. There's people there that 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 will help in the fact that it's not. Um, it's not something that you need to be ashamed of at all anymore. Whereas, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, you might have been considered weak, but you're really, you're really not. It's just a, a matter of, you know, understanding that there is support and, and conversations like this are really important. A question that came up the other day, actually, when I was speaking with, with Landsberg, just the way you're talking about it openly now, one of the questions that came up from a, <clears throat> from someone at RBC Bank asked how you, how a leader in an organization should approach the conversation. And I wondered how, if you bring that into, because each team's different in the OHL and you're in a lead role with a team, I wondered if you make that, now, of course, with what you've been through, how do you make that a part of your team, the culture that you are, in the end, the source of building and with your team? It, it's conversations and, you know, the OHL obviously had the unfortunate incident where, um, you know Terry Trafford, who played for for Saginaw, uh, completed suicide as well. And you know, I, really, I, I don't. You know, it's not something that I, I talk about every single day. But through the the Terry situation, they've come up with an initiative called Talk Today, which is a fantastic initiative where the billets and the players all get trained in in warning signs and how to communicate about it. And I think from a leadership role, I think it, it's like anything. You know, in life, people just don't want to be lied to. And you know, the the difficult thing, but also the rewarding thing, about being a coach is sometimes it's difficult to be honest with kids that are giving it their all, doing everything they possibly can to succeed, but maybe they're just not good enough at one thing right now, but you have to be honest and tell them that. And I, I think it's the same thing with mental health. Just be honest about it. Just be open. Just be upfront. And when we have our mental health training, which will be on uh, November 22nd, I believe, this year, uh, a lot of the young players, like they, they have no idea that I have a brother that completed suicide, but I'll walk in and I'll tell them exactly why I believe this is a really important subject and that, you know, hey, if they, if they need help, you know, I'm not going to think anything less of them. And, uh, you know, it'll actually think more of them for having the, the, the courage. And, and, and really, you shouldn't even say courage anymore, but just the character to, to speak up and, and admit and have that honest conversation with themselves. Yeah, like what to me, one of the most, the craziest thing, 
is, and again, going back, I know, I know this conversation, I'm just learning through everyone's story and, and going back to something Landsberg said, which I'm curious to your opinion on, because this is the million dollar question and, and I don't think there'll ever be a right or wrong answer is the idea of the people that don't want help when they, when they have, not even to the point where it's, it's suicidal thoughts, but thoughts that could lead to that. And people think when, when it's on this table, like people know what's going on and someone says you should, you should look for help. And they still know they have problems. It's not they're, they're not denying that they have problems. They just don't think they need or they don't want to look for help. What could you put into words or what your conversation would be or response would be to that, to someone that says, I know I'm depressed. I don't want to use medication. I don't want to talk to a therapist. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a great question, you know, but again, it's about being honest. And I, I think in that situation, you know, most people probably do this, but you offer to do it with them and give them every resource and, and really, you know, eliminate any excuse that they may have to, um, you know, to, to, to not seek help. And, and I think another good way is like if, if a person's like that, then not, hey, you, all you can do is still consider to say, hey, you know what, I'm here for you. And then you follow up with that person. And, and you know what, the other thing is, is I actually I had a really good friend of mine who, who I will not uh, name his name because he's, he's a childhood friend, but he came to me after he, he heard Mark's story and, you know, we reconnected after decades. And um, it, it was really neat because I, I had no idea that, but from a child, he had suffered from depression. And the way he does it is he'll just send out an email to his family and just says, I think he told me the, the, the color was yellow, yellow or red or something like that. And it was basically um, an alarm or, you know, a signal to his friends that I need help. I'm in a bad spot and let's somebody reach out to me just to talk because I think that's oftentimes the hardest part for somebody that you know is depressed or feeling you know feeling low or, or lack of confidence anxiety whatever the heck it may be which there's there's so many different things that could be but just giving that person the easiest route to be able to to reach out for help and and i thought that was a brilliant way to do it and i think that's a way to to keep the conversation going to you know hopefully lead somebody to get the proper help that they do need to become healthy right that's oh, that's super easy. I've never heard that. See, that's and that's why there's no. It's a million dollar question, which I think will have almost a million answers, but each thing could help. Like I think, that just then you don't have to put together a talk or explain your feelings or. It, it, it's it's no different than adversity in life, or you know, like when you talk about um, you know mourning, which a, a lot of you know when you talk about suicide, a lot of people talk about mourning, but everybody's different right everybody mourns differently everybody deals with their emotions differently and and i don't think there is a right answer for one person or another it's no different than learning like you know then you learn differently than say gabriel did or whoever it may be like you know everybody's that's why we're humans we're all individuals and it's a matter of finding the way that uh allows that person to see clearly and and you know at the end of the day supporting them in creative and different ways to to make sure that they know that there's people there to help them at this point i wanted to bring up a really cool point that smitty said earlier and that was the idea that there's two types of mental toughness and we're not ever told this really we always approach the idea of mental toughness as one way of being and I think it's so accurate that there are two types and two times when we should should utilize them and, and open our minds to those two different ideas. And the one is obviously performance, as we already heard, thinking rationally as much as possible. So we block those emotions out. But then once that performance is done, the ability and also having the right people around you that allow you to open up on that emotional side to almost decompress after having this high level stress it actually makes sense to, okay, now it's time to come back down. Performance is done. I blocked out those emotions, but now it's time to talk about it, figure it out. And in a way, now prepare for the next time I have to do that. Get familiar with those emotions. So then it's even easier to block them out the next time you go through that scenario. Yeah, eventually you have to deal with it. And, you know, I, I was guilty of that, you know, through through my process with, with Mark where, you know what, I shut it down and then eventually... You know the emotions got the better of me and you know you needed to talk about things and, and different things like that but when you talk about the mentally tough um i went out east this this spring to um see my little nephew who's seven years old and kids are a great example of because they they're not jaded they haven't been affected by anything mm -hmm. like really drew's only love in life is his family 
hockey and Fortnite. Like he, he <laughs> loves to do that. He's a gamer kid that loves to get on with some of my players, and that's how actually we talk now. I play Fortnite so that I, he'll talk to me. That's the only. He's not oh talking to me just on the phone. I yeah, get too yeah. boring, right? But <laughs> if we're playing Fortnite and building walls together, then all of a sudden I find out that they were learning about currency in class and stuff. But um, it, the perfect example is so we were in this tournament and the team just bolted through the tournament we get to the finals and it's raw motion but it, you know this is the difference between being mentally tough on the ice and mentally tough in in real life so uh we bolt through the tournament we get to the finals and then this number 71 from the cape breton team just took over it's one of those situations where the best player just and all of a sudden we're down by two goals seven five with like four and a half minutes left and poor little drew like just wanted the trophy right i think he wanted to show that was dad and and you know, if I'm going to be cocky, I think he wanted to, you know, yeah, lift the trophy exactly. with me there too, right? And they score, and I see him kind of getting teary-eyed. And so I yelled at him. I called him over. And I'm like, Drew, get over here. Get over here. And I kind of, you know, not grabbed him, but, like, you know, held the shirt. And I said, listen, we don't have time right now for, for crying. We need a goal. <laughs> and he's like, okay, okay. <laughs> and he went out and hit the post. We lose. But then where I'm going with this is after the game, when he was crying in the room, it was great, you know, because it was a good opportunity for me to explain to him, hey, you know what, you're in the middle of the game, you're in the middle of something, you gotta, you gotta stay focused and get the job done. But then after the game, hey, it, it's good that you're emotional. It shows that you care and it's okay to cry, buddy. And, you know, mm -hmm. Uncle Troy has done the same and all that. And that's really the difference, right? Like during the game, you got to be tough, you got to be strong. But then away from the game in the dressing right. room, it's okay to be vulnerable. Right. It's finding those spots too, I think, which which is a, a, you could go into, if you were talking human performance side, even taking this the next step is, is finding those those areas where, okay, it's time to open up and it's healthy to open up and then time to dial it in is when it's time to dial it in. I think having, the other thing too, is he has you as a resource and a, and a you know, an outlet, which <clears throat> helps in that, in that scenario, right? Whether you send someone, you know, a, a little message or it's a color or something, let's chat when you're, when you're away from human performance side and then hop back into it. I think that's, you know, an interesting, an interesting approach. And it, it's a, a way out that I think a lot of people could benefit from, because this isn't, yeah, we, we started with the idea of suicide, but this could be people that are living through maybe lesser cases or less intense forms of anxiety and depression that could mm -hmm. find a way out by having a, a relationship like that. Yeah. Which it, is, and, and for most people, I think the hardest part is, is just saying something like, hey, I need help or whatever it may be. But once that conversation has been had or, you know, you're starting to think that maybe that person, um, you know, isn't in a good spot, then just set that scenario up. Just say, hey, you know what? You don't even have to say anything. Just send me a note saying yellow, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it may be, and, and just find different ways to help people. In the culture of of sport and you and I both again I mean from the same organization you're coaching unfortunately lost someone that completed suicide in when you would approach a let's say an NHL locker room the next step where it's just a room mostly full of egos and you had the opportunity to to start this conversation in that locker room and that may be different than approaching a school right or approaching a classroom mm -hmm. how would you because I, I use this culture of sport as an example because then you go into a business, you go in somewhere else at, the, at these higher levels, competitive organizations, is it, you have to approach it differently. What would, would that approach be different than everything else we've, we've talked about so far? How would you really get them to kind of buy into what you're saying? Uh, I don't think my approach would be any different. I think it would just be an honest approach. Hey, guys, you know what? Here's, here's my story. Here's what... I've been through and you know hey it's okay to talk about it if we if we need help I, I don't think I think that's really what's made it good now is that people are, are starting to talk about it more openly without feeling like you know somebody's going to judge them or whatever it may be and, and hey I'll admit that like I was an aspiring young coach and I was in some ways uh, you know I, I don't know if I was afraid but I was definitely cognizant of the fact that you know I, I'm not sure if I want to bring that up and have people think you know whatever they want to think about me when realistically it's just hey it, it's part of you know my life it's part of what I went through and um, you know it doesn't make you any lesser that you had a family member who's 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 went through that it, it actually makes you stronger because you've got life experience and 
I, I really, I wouldn't change a thing, you know, whether it's an adult or, or a young kid, they need to hear the truth. Right, right. You know, and, and I think, you know, conversations are important. I've already picked up on it. Like, you know, you used the word uh, committed when we started this this conversation. I've used the word completed. Right. And you've started to switch that. I personally couldn't care less what the person says, but there's a lot of people out there. And I learned this from, from Tana Nash, who was the person who set me up to, to do my little talks and chats and things. And and even the language of committed, and you know, again, I'm getting very technical, which I don't care, but there's people out there that do. Yeah. Um, it, it's linked to the fact that you know, committing suicide was a crime at one point, which again makes it seem like it's not a sickness. It's just you know, you've committed a crime. So mm-hmm. completed is actually the the more proper term for it now, which which makes sense. Yeah, it well goes into a couple of past episodes we had when we were talking. We had one, the power of our narratives, and then talking with Brock McGillis, who you know of too, first openly gay professional hockey player. The how we say things has such a massive impact on how things are understood, depicted, and then and then explained to the next person. So when you're not here, and I'm telling and I'm talking to someone about what we talked about, and I use completed instead of committed, that plays a different role too. And looking at stats before I started this, um, and hearing for just through educating on my own is that not every you know completed is i think impactful to me because we forget about all the people that tried and Mm -hmm. and weren't successful which is is a terrible thing to know of but it it just makes it even more real this conversation why it's so important is that we have numbers on and it's top five leading cause of death in canada suicide we have numbers on that but we don't have all the numbers on how many people have tried and it's just you know, it's just, it's un, it's unfortunate, but I think a word that really gives it that much more attention to this is bigger than the numbers we even understand, which are already astronomical. Mm-hmm. So it's... And, and language is, is, is really important in other ways when you're talking about suicide too. Like, um, you know, again, Tana, you know, is kind of the one who, who's really helped me through all this to, you know, understand what you can and can't say. And, you know, I'll never talk about how he did things or you know the effect that it had on me immediately because those are all things that can trigger people to to do that the conversation really needs to stay with you know hey how do we find solutions to help you with your sickness really is is the key to all this not you know it's not that i i want to forget about mark i'll never forget about mark he's my little brother i'll I'll love him you know till the day i i leave the this earth but at the end of the day I, i want the conversation to be about means to getting better and i think when we talked about you know the yellow card or whatever it may be yeah th- those are, are great conversations to have right see that's a, every, people want to know what it is what can i say if i notice someone's acting different it's and then in some ways um, having the technique or approach of of explaining everything as open and as honest as possible this isn't this is i didn't even think of that like I would think that to help someone, you would want to open up totally and tell them about those dark, darker sides to the conversation. But that's not yeah, necessarily that's a, the best thing to do because it may trigger something. Like I, yeah. I didn't even think of that. Well, I, I didn't know about it either because my initial thought was, okay, I'm going to come in and I'm going to, you know, hit people over the head with the story, and it's really counterproductive. You know, conversations on how to find solutions is really what you know, what we need to do and, and what we need to, to get to. And, you know, guys like, like Michael Landsberg and, and you doing things like this are, are really, really important because the narrative has changed. It's come a long way, you know, whether it's be Bell Let's Talk or whatever it may be, but yeah. it still needs to, you know, to come a little bit further so that there's further understanding just to, uh, like you said, it's the top five leading cause of death in Canada. Um, and really those are, are deaths that can be, you know, mitigated in some in some instances. Mm-hmm. And not to again now not to put my foot in my mouth on this, but would you deal with your mental health differently? Well, first off, I guess is there fear for in your shoes of what could happen in in life, not just because it was your brother, but just the idea of suicide. Is there any fear there in your life? And then also, what do you do now to take care of your mental health? 
I'm, I'm starting to realize there are so many other things people can do that fit. Like you said, there's different people that do different things. No, like fear, fear doesn't enter my mind. I, I'm not that type of person. I, I would just say that I'm more cognizant of, you know, how people are acting and, you know, uh, body language, things like that. But, you know, for me, um, again, I'm a different person than, than others. You know, for me, I deal with stress differently, whether it's, you know, I got to wear a mouth guard at night because I grind my teeth, right? Like things like that yeah. or, you know, go exercise, mm-hmm. things of that nature. But, you know, I, I definitely I don't live in fear of anything that way. Um, you know, I, I think I've grown a lot through that experience because, you know, the one thing I think I, I did learn is that you do have to talk about it and you have to learn how to deal with it. Because if not, eventually it just boils over to where you're forced into dealing with it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was really um you know, probably the biggest lesson I learned from it from a, a personal standpoint is that, you know, you can't just be stoic and worry about everybody else. You have to be, I think you said mindfulness, but like mindful of yourself as well. Right. And, and you know, in some ways, hey, be selfish sometimes to, to give yourself a break and, you know, things that, that I've done to deal with, with stress. You know, I, I don't, I've never had issues, um, you know, like suicidal thoughts or anything like that, but I was just even just going to a movie by myself. It sounds stupid, but literally being alone in the movie theater is my greatest stress relief because I shut my phone off. I watch the movie. I don't have to talk about the movie after with anybody. I'm just, (laughs) I'm by myself. And when I walk out, okay, you're clear, you're good. You've had a little bit of a break and everybody's different. My job's very busy. There's a lot of different moving parts. I love it. And, you know, when you love something, you're passionate about something, a lot of times it can consume your life where, you know, those wins and losses or whatever, line combinations, all the different things that make a a coach's head spin, um, you know, yeah, you you have to find your own way to deal with stress. It's funny how Smitty used the word selfish here because when I was talking to another mental health advocate and he asked me about what I did for my mental health, I actually used the exact same word. I said, well, I do this and it feels selfish, but that's what I do anyways. And what I said was I bring up different people in the media and different topics of depression and anxiety with my peers and just randomly bring it up as if I would bring up any other conversation and chat about it and I find it makes me feel good having an open conversation with people that are close to me and people I care about and want to accept me and they know I'm talking about depression and anxiety and that I care about it or have interest in it and that helps me and so I said that was selfish and this individual said no that's actually not selfish at all that's you taking care of your mental health and you should be doing that. So don't think that's selfish. And I thought that was a key point and interesting that Smitty thought the exact same thing, that going to the theater, turning his phone off, we're in a time where we're told that that's selfish and we should be responding to our phones and doing what, I guess, what society makes us think we should be doing. And really, that's not the right way to be thinking. It's put yourself first, put your health first, your mental health first. That, see, that's another thing that, that everyone's different. I think we often, it's like fitness. I'm, th- I'm starting to realize with, with taking care of mental health, it's unfortunately become a market that people and business people are some taking advantage of, some offering great things, Headspace and Calm and those apps like that are great. I'm realizing, I mean, there's an example of, of a movie, which isn't anything, it's not yoga, it's not mindfulness, that people often think they have to do the latest and greatest mental health hack or whatever it is, if it's drinking tea or lavender, or et cetera, which if it works for you, awesome. But I think it's, it's in, an interesting conversation when you talk with people that have very different or non-mainstream ways of dealing with mental health and taking note of that is that everyone is different. So an app isn't going to work for everyone. And if it's not working for you, that doesn't mean you can't find another way to, you know, work hey, on your... Yeah, find your own avenue, you know, and and try different things. Like you said, like, you know, an app will probably just put me to sleep, to be honest with you. But it's, you know, and maybe uh, my perspective is different because I deal with 24 different individuals. They're all different. You know, some of them, you know, need a little bit of a firmer kick in the butt. And then other ones, you got to realize that, hey, you know what, sometimes, you know, what's two inches up from your butt would be a, a pat on the back works better for some kids. And that's all development as, as a coach, but I think, you know, you can learn or you can use that stuff in life as well. And, and really at the end of the day, um, just try and support people. Right. Right. You know, and, and, you know, if somebody's, if you suspect somebody's like that, just tell them you care. You know, sometimes it blows people away how much just telling them, Hey, I care. 
You know, right. it's, it's, it's important to say that stuff. Especially in a situation where you don't expect that or you're in a, a, a situation where this is a way bigger issue than what we're talking about. It's a bigger social kind of topic, but it's the idea of a be, showing you care in a situation where it's not necessarily the response or the comment you would expect. I mean, that, that could empower someone incredibly, whether it's mental health or just performance in whatever the task is, thinking about the sport culture. And it's changed since I was, since my first year in, in major junior, the idea of this tough, stoic, you know, now coaches like yourself are more open up to say, hey, you know, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yell at you and you may get pissed off at me some days, but at the very end of the day, no, like you being able to tell someone you care is, you know, it's, it's tough for individuals like you and for other coaches that want that buy-in, but then on the flip side can make a world of difference. Yeah, it, for me, it just goes back to honesty. You know, your, your delivery is still very, very important how you deliver that message, but I think if the kids know that you're being honest with them because you care and you want to see them do well and obviously help the team and things like that, the end of the day they figure it out they don't always leave with a, a giant smile on their face but mm -hmm. you know one thing that our coaches try to do is always end each each meeting with a positive if we can um you know which is important for mindset and stuff but you know honest conversations are tough but honest conversations are important and especially when it comes to you know what we're kind of talking about here which is, is suicide awareness because yeah. You know, without people bringing these conversations to the forefront, there's just not enough honest conversations. And the more honest conversations we can have about mental health, the further we're going to move along. More honest conversations. I thought what Smitty just said was so powerful because it's so true. It goes back to the idea of toughness, of accepting where you are and then finding a way through that. But until we accept where we are, we can't find a way through. Let me put it in another way. If we want to get through our adversity and we see the end goal of where we want to get to, but no one has had an honest conversation with us of where we are and what stands in our way, or we're not willing to accept that honest response we're getting from someone, then we don't know where we are. So to now put together a plan from where we are to where we know we want to get to, we can't. How do you, you can't do that. You know where you, you want to get to, but you don't know where you are. So to put together a plan is going to be extremely difficult. But if we're able to have that honest conversation, know where we are, know exactly what stands in our way, okay, now I can start to put together a plan, a plan of action, one that I can see, I can visualize, I can understand. The other thing, actually, in that situation is now you can find different routes. One way it doesn't work, okay, I understand this landscape now. I know what's going on. Now I can try this. I can try that. And ultimately, you can find a way through it. And so I guess moving moving on from the idea of, or the topic of of suicide and I and the reason I want to it's not even I don't want to make a huge jump in conversation because I want the the main concept to be that we need to make these conversations in the locker room they need to be in at the coffee maker in the office they need to be at the schoolyard they you know whether maybe not always about suicide but this idea concept of depression and anxiety and you know now I've met people that have bipolar and work full-time jobs and, and live a, a normal life do they take medication? Do they have coping mechanisms they use? For sure. But making it a part of, of everyday conversation is important. So that's why we'll just say a pivot into your side of, um, <laughs> which is, I laugh, only, and mainly because I don't remember any of it <laughs> at all. But I want to hear your two cents on the night that I was hurt. And I know you had a little bit of ex experience of your own. I think a couple different experiences there. And, and one was with my one of my family members so yeah, yeah if you want to go into that <laughs> yeah, well it's you know like we can laugh about it now yes, because exactly. you know hey you're, you're sitting here and you and i have become friends which is the great thing about coaching at least i hope i can call you a friend yes, at this yes. point. <laughs> but uh no that was you know i, I don't want to become too dramatic you know to be honest i don't remember a ton you remember snippets of it um i remember seeing it happen you know, after that, I remember being at, at the hospital in, in Kitchener with, with your agent, Rob Hooper, and kind of hearing the helicopter and just thinking, okay, this isn't good. And, um, you know, but I, I really remember your grandpa. And, th and this isn't to make you emotional because I know mm -hmm. you loved your grandpa, but that man was a rock star that night because, hey, there was a lot of emotions for a lot of different reasons and a lot of very valid, valid reasons. But 
Um, the one thing I would say about that night, that if there's one thing that you can take away, is just what a tremendous man your grandfather was. When you talk about being you know, strong in a moment and mentally strong, he was everything that and more. Like, he really took us all in as a team and just, hey, here's the situation. It was honest, right? We weren't sure where, you know, where you were going to be uh, um, at that point, but, you know, he, he calmed the situation. He was, he was unbelievable. Like, I'll, I'll never forget how good your grandfather was that night. And then eventually, you know, thankfully, you know, they said you were kind of, you know, not out of the woods, but you were in much, you were stable, right? Mm -hmm. You went from critical to stable. And, and of course we're in my hometown, the hammer and in, in <laughs> Hamilton and, and it was October 30th. I, I think you know that. I, yeah, I would assume yeah. that you do. It was October 30th and it was a Friday night. And, this kind of broke the ice. It was actually perfect because so we're at the Hamilton General and all of a sudden a girl who's in a Halloween costume, which is, we'll just say, um, a little revealing, right? So that kind of, you know, out of the corner of my eye, look. And then I look down and she's pushing, I'm assuming, her boyfriend in a wheelchair and he had obviously been on the wrong side of talking to somebody from the north end the wrong way and he's got blood and he's got a big black guy he did, he'd been beat up pretty good and, and so i look at her and then i look down at him and i must have done a double take you would think i'd do the double take the other way around but i double take on him he looks at me and, and i'm not going to swear about it he goes what the what the blank are you looking at and everybody just started laughing at that point like he, even your mother like sue you know even she had a chuckle at that point it, it was great it was uh it was a good way to end the night and you know my memories of that you know some of them you know, i'd like to block out but i think you know the the greatest memory is just how you've persevered and, you know i um you know, we really probably haven't said that but you know i remember going to the hospital with spotter the one day and um you know, we thought you were still in bed and still out cold mm -hmm. and we see we see your mom and you know all of a sudden you know we see you walking around and we're kind of like i know it's close to halloween <laughs> but like this guy's supposed to be in bed still and there you were you're doing laps and you know hey good for you and i'm glad it all worked out but um yeah that was a, that was a, a scary night but i um, glad we got through it well that's a cool side of it it's, it's interesting to hear when you don't remember you know, much of it. You remember blurry moments. I, I think my mom says I was telling everyone I loved them. So I don't know if you got an I love you too. No, but no probably I say not. <laughs> probably not. Mom, get this guy out of here. This guy <laughs> makes me skate laps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not, he's going to yell at me about turning the puck over. <laughs> about stopping, not pivoting. We yeah. want a full stop on the skates there, Ben. Not a pivot, not a stop turn. <laughs> yeah, I don't miss that. I don't miss that. <laughs> and I did an episode with Emily Kaplan, who's a... Um, a sports journalist was with Sports Illustrated, and the one thing I try to take something from every every guest, and the one thing she said to ask people that can open things up and really get to know someone is, what's what's bigger than what you do to you? What's bigger than your your career and what you do? Are there things in your life that? you may not even people may not even know that hey this is something i'm passionate about i care about it or here's a hobby i have you know we've already heard about the how important going to a movie and shutting your phone off and separating yourself from from the hectics of coaching is is there is there something bigger than the game of hockey and, and what you do every day well and the easy answer is is quite simply through you know through mark it's it's family family and friends and and relationships because at the end of the day at some point nobody's going to want me to coach you know i'll be too blind to scout you know and i'll be out of the game and what are you going to be left with you're going to be left with family and friends which is actually a very comforting feeling but at the end of the day that's what it is and i think that's why it's so important that we need to look after each other and have you know honest conversations and, and really those are the most valuable relationships where you can Somebody can tell you something that that hurts in the moment, but is truthful, honest, and intended to make you you better. Whether it's a better person, better hockey player, or better student, whatever it may be. But you know, honest conversations for me really show um, show that person that you care. I'm curious about this for my own my own side of things, but I guess other people listening that are leaders of groups or trying to motivate people. When I mean, we just had a, a pretty tough loss the other day that I don't want to get into. But when you have when you're in a situation where you're right in the heart of the middle of a game and nothing is going the right way and you have to start to turn the ship around, 
to me, the most important thing is the first thing you do. And in that situation, I could be wrong. I'm sure some people would say, oh, well, you need a st- steps of one to four. Here's what you do to turn things around. But I'm a big believer that it's the very first thing you decide to do in that situation that's going to depict if you can turn the ship around or not. And I'm curious what your initial thought or what you say or how you act in that situation to start turning things around. Yeah, I think, like, it, so you want to kind of more go hockey-wise, like um, in a game, or... you? Yeah, sure, because then I, I think you can relate that to, to other things. Like, I think from a coaching perspective, th- those situations are set up well before the game. So when you meet as a team for the first time, how you're going to play, what you expect, things like that. And I, I actually stole this from Nick Saban. He has a thing called the process, which you'll hear my players, and you would have been one of those guys yeah. that like, oh, it's process, right? And like we make a joke of it now, but it's it's serious. But at the right time, it's you know we were talking about being on time, for example, the other day, and the guys like the kid who's kind of been late sometimes. He's like, ah, it's the process, Smitty. I got it right. Which yeah. so what the process is is. Um, Basically, we don't care about what happened before, you know, whether it's good, bad, or whatever. We're just con- continually trying to progress and believe in the process that we're going to get better. So, for example, we were down 5 nothing against Guelph the other night, and you would think that I would go in there and, you know, kick some garbage cans around, maybe break a few sticks, throw a few, you know, F-bombs out there at the boys. But to be honest, I didn't yell at all. I just said, hey, you know what, we're in the situation. Um, you know, let's stick to the process. I don't care if we win at this point. Let's just make sure that we're continuing to get better so that the next games. But that conversation about process started back in training camp. So how you set things up, the, the culture, the environment that you build uh, within your workplace is, is, is priceless. You know, at the end of the day, culture is everything. If you want to get the most out of your employees, uh, most out of your your players, whatever it may be, you know, you show them the work ethic, you show them all the different things, whatever your pillars are um, for what you want to build that organization around, it, it's important that those pillars represent the culture that you want. And if you have the proper culture, then I, I think at some point you'll find success. I'm not going to say there's not going to be bumps in the road, mm-hmm. but you'll find that success. And, and don't stray from that. You have to be committed to that and, and understand that, you know, for, for us, it's the process of we're just going to get better, get better, get better. You know, if you have a great shift, move on. You got a bad shift, move on. It's the same thing. We just got to worry about what's in front of us, not ahead of us, and definitely not what's behind us. Right, right, right. The process. Well, there's another another point for us. If it's only from... I had that when I coached you. <laughs> I would be, be in the NHL. NHL. <laughs> yeah, we'd both be in there. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. In conclusion... I have to ask, since you brought it up, um, what caliber of Fortnite player are you? I don't play, but I, it's the talk of the town, so I have to ask. Yeah, well, I, I'm not too, too bad. I don't play a ton. I play with Drew, right, generally. Right. I've got one solo win, a couple squads. Um, <laughs> it's, you know what, like, I, I've never been a gamer. Like, even back to Super Mario Brothers, I, I, I was a gamer for a while with Tetris when I was about 12, 13 years old. But then I couldn't go to sleep because I'd see shapes when I shut my eyes. So at that point, I just stopped video gaming. But then when I went out to this tournament to visit Drew and he was playing video games, I was like, geez, I can't get this kid to talk to me on the phone. And we live so far away that I don't get to see him. I was like, I better become a gamer. So I wouldn't classify myself as a gamer, but I I can play. But I'm not very good. Like, (laughs) I I can't build. I can't do anything. I just... um, Fortnite players would understand this. I'm a hide in the bushes type of player. Okay. I just hide and wait and hope that nobody finds me. But at the end of the day, it's it's been an unbelievable way for me to connect with my nephew to the point where you know what he only wants to play with me. Where it's just the two of us in what they call a party in the gamer world, <laughs> and it's just the two of us talking. And we talk about life, talk about hockey, talk about school, and and uh, it's a weird way around it, but. Hey, you know what? I had to find the individual way to connect with my nephew mm-hmm. that way to the point where now my niece, who's a cheerleader and really wants nothing to do with video games, 
she wants to play Fortnite so that she can talk to me. And oh. Now I've become the cool guy. I thought which, you were going to say she wants you to start cheerleading. No, well, that was, that, that's a whole other podcast, man. I don't yeah, we don't have time for that no, today. No, I'm not going there. I can't. Yeah, I can barely touch my toes. I can't imagine I'd be doing any anything like that. Well, this is this has been awesome. I know you're busy, and and best of luck tonight against. Against the old squad for both of us, so I wish yeah. you. Uh, do you really mean that? Rece- I do. I you know do? I do. I do because we were together. We were together. Rangers back in Nation the day. will not be happy with you. No. Ben Finelli is cheering for the Spirit. Can we get that on for record? one night? For one night. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, you can cheer for me. All right, thanks a lot. All right, thanks, Ben. That brings us to the end of another Heroic Minds podcast. I want to thank everyone for listening the positive reviews on the platform you're listening on. And if you haven't done so and you're enjoying these podcasts, feel free to leave a positive review wherever it is you're listening to this. The other thing is I want to welcome more feedback. As of late, the feedback via my Instagram or email has been absolutely awesome. So I encourage more feedback on those. I love having these conversations uh, off the podcast. It's incredible the people that have reached out and what they share or even constructive criticisms. I'm totally open to hearing what you have to say to improve things. Don't feel like you'll hurt my feelings. I want to, I want to be better. I want to improve. So I'm willing to hear your feedback. The other thing is if you want to check out the guests, what they look like, maybe some snippets of from each episode, you can check out my Instagram or my Twitter and follow along there. My name is Ben Finelli. This is the Heroic Minds Podcast. We'll talk again soon.